Good evening, everyone. Okay, let's take out our study guides, have a word of prayer, and get right into our information this evening. We've got an exciting message in store for you. The Rock That Simply Will Not Roll, Part 2. That's right. So let's begin with a word of prayer, and we'll dive right into our message proper. Okay? Father in heaven, we come before you this evening, and we are anticipating a blessing. Father, we are coming to you because you are a prayer-hearing, prayer-answering God. We know that you will hear, and more than that, you will answer. Father, the cry of our heart tonight is for biblical truth. And so please, tonight, as we open your word, may you send the spirit that inspired these scriptures to now be the spirit that instructs in these scriptures. Father, you have promised to send the spirit of truth to guide us into all truth. And tonight, the yearning, craving desire of our hearts is for biblical truth. So please, be with us this evening, and may we have an experience, a rich experience with you in your word. We ask this in Jesus' name. Let everyone say, Amen. Amen. Okay, so let's go right to our study guide. And instead of reading that whole great big long paragraph there, what I'd like you to do is look just down about midway through. It says, we have seen that the dividing issue at the end of time will be the issue of worship. worship. Exactly right. Additionally, we have seen that the Antichrist will be a subtle, religious, what's that word? Imposter, more than a violent political opposer. We have emphasized the importance of standing on the rock of Christ, His word, and His perfect law of love. Now we are poised to grasp one of the issues, the most significant issues in the book of Revelation in its larger significance. What issue strikes at the heart of worship, biblical fidelity, tradition versus the commandments of God, and the subtle religious sophistries of Satan? We will answer that important question in this lesson. So let's go directly to the screen. Now, how many of you remember that old television show? I think it was called Dragnet, where the old fellow would say, just the... Remember that? Just the facts, ma'am. Just the facts. Okay, tonight I'm going to give you just the facts, okay? Nothing but the facts. This information may be new to many of you. What you do with this information is between you and who? God. I want to underscore that. The truth sometimes what? Hurts, but God sends truth because He loves us and what? Cares for us. Now, how many of you tonight want Bible truth? Okay, very good. Let's notice our next slide here. Notice the top says, truth can hurt, but the bottom says, error can kill. Do you see that? Truth sometimes hurts, but truth is always better than error. And remember the other day, we said that the difference between a surgeon and a butcher is that a butcher cuts to kill and a surgeon cuts to heal. God is not a butcher. He's a surgeon. And tonight, I'm going to be perfectly candid with you. Some of you are going to be cut a little bit. But remember, God never sends us truth to hurt us or to humiliate us, but to enlighten us so we can be faithful and obedient to him. Now, listen to this. We expect our doctors to tell us the truth. Is that right? Yes or no? Absolutely. We expect the same of our bankers, accountants, investors, and lawyers. I'm looking across the room right over here at a good friend of mine, Al Green. And Al Green does my taxes. I expect Al Green to tell me the truth about what I owe the United States government on my taxes. Yes or no? That's the professional expectation that I have of Al Green. Now, shouldn't we want our preachers and teachers to do the same? Isn't that right? I mean, if we have the expectation that our accountant tells us the truth and our banker tells us the truth and our doctor tells us the truth and our lawyer tells us the truth, we should have the same expectation of those who work and who deal with eternal truth. Amen? And so that's what we're going to be doing today. Now, according to the book of Revelation, the central issue at the end of time will be the issue of worship. The conflict will pit true biblical worship against false man-made worship. Open your Bibles to the book of Revelation. Revelation chapter 14. Revelation in the 14th chapter. Now here in Revelation chapter 14, we find what is sometimes referred to as the three angels' messages. And we'll spend more time on this in the future. These are three very important, very significant messages that are given by angels. The word angel in the Greek simply means the bearer of a message. And here there are three messages. Let's just take a quick look at the first angel's message, beginning in verse 6. Revelation chapter 14 and verse 6. John says, Then I saw another what? Angel flying in the midst of where? Heaven, so this is a heavenly message, having the everlasting 
gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people. So in other words, this message is for everyone. It is a universal message. Verse 7, saying with a loud voice, fear God and give glory to Him, for the hour of His judgment has come, and worship Him who made. Notice that. Worship Him who made. Who made what? Who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and the springs of waters. Now, we have said before that there are 404 verses in the book of Revelation. How many verses, everyone? 404 verses, and a full 270 at least of those come directly from the Old Testament. Now, that verse that you just read there in verse 7 is the single largest quotation from the Old Testament in the entire book of Revelation. Right there in verse 7, I'll read it again. It says, And worship Him, and here it is, who made the heaven and the earth and the seas and the springs of waters. So that is the single largest verbatim quotation in the entire book of Revelation of an Old Testament passage. And I want you to notice what it has to relate to. It relates to worshiping God as the creator of heaven and earth. Worshiping God as what, everyone? The creator of heaven and earth. In fact, there are two reasons that we worship God. There are how many reasons? Two reasons. Open your Bible to Revelation chapter 4. Revelation chapter 4. There are two primary reasons that we worship God, and I'll pick one up in Revelation chapter 4 and verse 10. Revelation chapter 4 and verse 10, here we have this marvelous throne room scene. And in this marvelous throne room scene, there are angels and there are elders and there are these strange looking beasts and they are worshiping him that sits on the throne. I'm in verse 10. The 24 elders fall down before him, him being God, who sits on the throne. And what do they do? Worship. worship him who lives forever and ever. And they cast their crowns before the throne saying, now watch what they do. Watch what they say. You are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power for or because you what? created all things, and by your will they exist and were created. We're worshiping you because you're the creator. We're worshiping you because you made us and you made everything. Now look in Revelation chapter 5. Revelation chapter 5, verse 12. Here the Lamb has come into the throne room. He has taken the scroll out of the hand of him who sits on the throne. He sits down on that same throne and says in verse, or the, those that are around say in verse 12, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and what? Glory. Look at verse 9. You are worthy to take the scroll to open its seals for you were slain and you have redeemed us to God by your blood out of every tribe, tongue, and people and nation and have made us kings and priests to our God and we shall reign on the earth forever. Jump down to verse 14. And the four living creatures said, Amen. And the 24 elders fell down and what did they do, everyone? Worshiped, Worshiped him who lives forever and ever. So here in Revelation chapter 4 and 5, we find the two primary reasons why God is worshiped. Number one, because he's our creator. And number two, because he's our savior and our redeemer. Does that make sense, everyone? And so here in this first angel's message of Revelation chapter 14, there's this call, fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment is come and worship him. And then he quotes from the Old Testament, who made the heaven, the earth, the sea and the springs of waters. There is this clarion call to worship God as the creator. So far, so good, everyone? powerful biblical call, worship God as creator, worship God as the redeemer. Now, of course, if those are the two reasons that we worship God, then Satan, through the Antichrist, is going to try and undermine those two things so that we won't see God as our creator and we won't see him as our redeemer and thus won't render to him the worship that is due. Amen, everyone? Now look at Revelation chapter 13 again. Revelation chapter 13, and I'm on the screen here. The conflict, as we've already said, will pit true biblical worship against false man-made worship. Now, let me show you a startling Bible fact here, an amazing Bible fact. The real issue is worship. You'll notice that the word worship is a contraction of two words, worth-ship. In other words, whatever you worship is what's worth the most to you. If your car is worth the most to you, that's what you worship. If sports are worth the most to you, that's what you worship. If your family is worth the most to you, that's what you worship. If God is worth the most to you, that's what you worship. Now, the word worship occurs 24 times in the book of Revelation. That's more than any other book in the entire Bible. Okay? Any book in the, no book in the Bible contains the word worship more than the book of Revelation. So consistently here, worship, 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 worship is the consistent reverberating issue in the book of Revelation. If that makes sense, everyone say amen. Now we're in Revelation chapter 13. 
In fact, I think I've got it here on the screen for you. Verse, actually, Revelation 12, 9, we'll quote that one first. It says, so the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old called the devil and Satan, who deceives just a small portion of the world. He was cast to the earth and his angels were cast out with him. Is that what the verse says? It says he deceives half of the world. He deceives 60% of the world. He deceives how much of the world according to that verse? All the world, the whole world. Notice this, Revelation chapter 13 and verse 3. Half of the world marveled and followed the beast. 70%. All the world marveled and followed the beast. How about verse 8? All who dwell on the earth will worship him whose names have not been written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. So we have these three texts there. They're right there in your study guide that make it crystal clear to us that this idea of all the world being deceived, of all the world wandering after the beast, is, is not something that we as Christians should be surprised about. Tonight, if we discover that much of the world has in fact wandered after the beast, we shouldn't go, what? I'm so surprised. I can hardly believe it. We should say that's exactly what we would expect because that's what the Bible says. Are we clear? In fact, we should be surprised if we found that the world wasn't wandering after the beast. Does that make sense? I mean, three times it says all the world, all the world, all the world. And so our expectation, our what everyone? Our expectation is that we would find the whole world wandering in some respect after the beast. And I'm going to maintain tonight that it centers around this idea of worship, true biblical worship versus man-made worship. What do these verses have in common there on your study guide? They all describe the universality of deception. They all describe the universality of deception. That is to say that it's not just an isolated group here and there, but the whole world is depicted as falling under the sophistries of Satan and the Antichrist power. In this lesson, we will learn that many unknowingly are living under one of the most subtle deceptions of the Antichrist. We should not be surprised, is what you'd write there. We should not be surprised if we discover that much of the world has unwittingly bought into one of the deceptions of the last days. In fact, according to Revelation, as we have said, we should what? Expect it. Remember, we do not arrive at truth by a majority vote, but by the Bible. Bible. Okay, we're on page number two. We're making very good time. Now, I want to present to you right now on the board a claim that you are going to find to be, many of you, totally shocking. So buckle your safety belts, everyone. If there's safety belts in those chairs, you want to buckle them right now. I'm going to present to you historical claims, and then we're going to investigate the truthfulness or the veracity of these historical claims that we put up here on the screen. Okay? Jesus says in Matthew chapter 28 and verse 18, how much authority has been given to me? All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. That's the claim of Jesus. Okay? According to the book of Revelation, there will be two calls to worship, and two claims on what? Authority. Now notice the word authority has as its root word the word author. So Jesus has a legitimate authority over us because he is our author. That is, he's the one who made us. Are we all clear on that, everyone? Okay, so let's continue here. Let's put some of these claims up here. Daniel chapter 7, verse 25. One of the identifying characteristics of the Antichrist. He shall speak pompous words against, against the Most High. He shall persecute the saints. Who's the saints, everyone? We are. we are. You've got it. The saints of the Most High and shall intend to change times. I want you to look at that. Times and laws. Well, let's take a look at a few of these historical claims that have been made by the Roman church state. We've looked at this one twice. Let's look at it again. Lucius Ferrari's Prompta Bibliothica. The bishop of Rome is of so great authority and power that he can what, everyone? Modify, explain, or interpret even what kind of laws? Divine laws. He can modify divine law since his power is not of man but of God and he acts as vicegerent or representative of God upon the earth. So the Bible says that one of the identifying characteristics of the Antichrist power is that he would think that he had the prerogative to change and to modify the very laws of God and the times of God. The what, everyone? Times, times of God. Now let me show you several, again, historical statements here on the screen. Notice them. First one, from the Reverend Peter Geierman from the Converts Catechism of Doctrine, page 50. Question, the whole catechism is set up in question and answer format. Question, which is the what? Sabbath day. Answer, this is the answer. Saturday is the Sabbath day. Question, why do we observe Sunday instead of Saturday? Now notice the claim. Notice the claim. We observe Sunday instead of Saturday because the church transferred the solemnity from Saturday to what? Sunday. Sunday. Do you see what he's saying? What day is the Sabbath? Saturday is the Sabbath. Wait, 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 wait a minute. Why do we keep Sunday instead of Saturday? Oh, the church changed it. 
Okay, let's show another one here. This one's from the Catholic Encyclopedia, volume four, four, page 153. The church, after changing the day of rest from the Jewish Sabbath of the seventh day of the week to the first, made the third commandment to refer to Sunday as the day to be kept holy as the Lord's day. Who made the change according to the claim? The church made the claim. Remarkable. Let's look at another one here. The American Catholic Quarterly Review, January 1883. Protestantism, in discarding the authority of the church has no good reason for its Sunday theory and ought logically to keep Saturday with the Jews. Okay, let's look at still another one. Literally hundreds of these could be given. I'm just giving you a few. Canon and Tradition, page 263. The authority of the church could not therefore be bound to the authority of the scriptures because the church had changed. The who had changed? The church had changed the Sabbath to Sunday, not by the command of Christ, but by its own authority, okay? So here we find this remarkable, remarkable claim being made by the historical Roman church state, we change the day of worship from the biblical Sabbath, Saturday, to Sunday, our day. Now, our question today is this. It's a very simple question. What is the Bible answer? What we're going to ask is this. Can Sunday sacredness be supported from the Bible, or is it merely a relic of church? What's that word? Tradition. Tradition a command of the who? The Roman church state. That's what we're going to discover tonight. So look at your study guide there, right at the top of page two. The Roman church state has historically made one of the most remarkable and disturbing claims known to man. Namely, they claim that they actually changed the day of worship from Sabbath to Sunday. From Sabbath to to Sunday. Okay, you can jump down there to the bottom. Our question is this, is this remarkable claim true or can the change from Sabbath to Sunday be supported from the what everyone? From the Bible. That's what we're going to ask tonight. So we go to the beginning and that would bring us to the book of Genesis. Let's go to Genesis chapter 1. Genesis chapter 1. The question we're asking tonight is, can Sunday sacredness be supported from the Bible, or is it a tradition and a relic of the Roman church state? We're in Genesis chapter 1, beginning in verse 1. In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. And you have here the six days of creation. Go to verse 31. And God saw everything that He had made, and indeed it was... Very good. The evening and the morning were the sixth day. Genesis chapter 2, verse 1. Thus the heavens and the earth and all the host of them were finished. Take that word finished and hang it on a hook in your mind. We're coming back to it. So it was finished. It was what, everyone? Finished. Verse 2. And on the seventh day, God ended his work which he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had done. Then God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because in it he rested from all his work which God had created and made. I have a question for you today. Was God tired? I mean, was God just exhausted and fatigued? He came home and he just had to put his feet up and take a day of rest? No, 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 no. But God did take a day of rest on that seventh day, and the question would be then, why? Why would God do such a thing? The answer is not because God was tired, but because God was setting an example for mankind. God was setting a what, everyone? An example. God doesn't need rest, but do I need rest? Do you need rest? Absolutely. So God did three things to the seventh day. We just read it there in those verses. Number one, God blessed it. Number two, God sanctified it. The word sanctified means he set it aside for a holy purpose. And number three, God rested on it. Okay, so you'd write that right down in your study guide there. God blessed it, God sanctified it, and God rested on it. Okay? Do you see that in the text, everyone? Yes or no? Okay, now we're in the study guide again. Clearly, God wanted the Sabbath to be set apart as special. In fact, the word sanctified means to set apart for a holy, special purpose. God could have created the earth in one second. Can you say amen? I mean, God could have just created the whole thing in one nanosecond. He could have just thought it and boom, it existed. But he did this for a reason. He created for a reason. Day number one, day number two, day number three, day number four, day number five, day number six, resting on the seventh. Now, you think about all of our cycles. We have a solar year and we have a lunar month and we have a solar day. But what, what phenomenon happens out in the stellar heavens every seven days? Does anything happen, you know, astrologically and cosmologically every seven days? 
No, why do we have a seven-day week? One reason, God commanded a seven-day week. There's nothing that happens every seven days, okay? At least not in terms of the stellar heavens. So we have a solar day, we have a lunar month, we have a solar year, but this weekly cycle was set up by God as an example and a pattern. As a what, everyone? As a pattern. Now you're back to your study guide there. Remember me. Open your Bibles to Exodus chapter 20. Exodus is the second book of the Old Testament, Exodus chapter 20, and here we find the Ten Commandments. That's exactly right. The last time we were together, we looked at those Ten Commandments, and we saw that those Ten Commandments were actually written by the finger of God on tables of stone, and they were placed where? In the ark. And we discovered that those commandments were actually carved out of the very throne, the very sapphire throne of God Himself. Unchanging, immutable, powerful and glorious. So, Exodus chapter 20, and you will notice that there are ten commandments, and eight of them begin with thou shalt not. Thou shalt not, thou shalt not, thou shalt not, thou shalt not. Eight commandments say, don't do this behavior. I like to say it this way, a corpse could keep eight of the ten commandments. Okay, a corpse can keep eight out of the ten, because eight out of the ten say, don't do a behavior. Okay, corpses don't steal, corpses don't kill, corpses don't have other gods, but two of the commandments are framed in the positive, and one of them is found in chapter, pardon me, chapter 20, verse 8. The first word of verse 8 is what? Remember. remember. Notice it's not thou shalt not, but it's remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. holy. Very interesting. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. Where did that come from? Six days and resting on the seventh came from creation. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Jews. Oh, is that what it says? The seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord. the Lord, your God. In it you shall do no work, you nor your son, your daughter, nor your male servant, nor your female servant, nor your cattle, nor your stranger who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea, and all that is in them, and he rested the Seventh day, therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. You see that there in verse 11 where it says he made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and all that in them is? Earlier, we've already read in Revelation chapter 14 and verse 6. Remember that? I told you this is the largest quotation in the entire book of Revelation from the Old Testament. I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth, and to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God, and give glory to Him, for the hour of His judgment has come, and worship Him that made the heaven, the earth, the sea, and the fountains of waters. That quotation comes directly from the fourth commandment. Did you know that? It comes directly. John was saying, remember the fourth commandment. Well, that stands to reason because the first word of the fourth commandment is the word remember. That's exactly right. Now, if my wife says to me, sweetie, on your way out the door as you're going to the store, remember to pick up bread. The reason she says remember to pick up bread is that she'd already told me to pick up the bread probably five times knowing my wife. And she's telling me to remember it because she thinks I'm going to Forget it. You've got it. She could never tell me to remember something she hadn't first told me about. And so when God here says remember, He's reminding them about creation. About what, everyone? Creation. creation. So remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Go to your study guide. So there it says, Remember me in Exodus chapter 20, the chapter containing the Ten Commandments. God reminds His people about the importance of the Sabbath. We can be sure that God was reminding them, to, uh, reminding them about the day because it begins with the command... The word, pardon me, remember. Don't forget who wrote this law. Who wrote it, everyone? God, with His finger on tables of stone, and it was placed where? In the ark. God wrote this law on stone to show that it did not change. God made this day holy in Genesis, and here in Exodus, He reminds the people about it. It is worth noting that only God can make anything holy. Can you say amen? I mean, who am I to make anything holy? I say, I want this pulpit to be holy. Is that pulpit suddenly holy? No, 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 no. But if God makes something holy, then He can tell me, listen carefully, to keep it that way. Do you see that, everyone? Some people say, well, I'm just going to keep any old day as the Sabbath. Wednesday will be my Sabbath. But wait a minute. God didn't say, make a day holy. He said, keep the day that I already made holy, holy. Does that make sense? He didn't say, make it that way. He said, Keep it that way. Okay, so far so good. Let's continue. We're there on uh, page three. Man, we're making incredible time. Consider the following texts. Ezekiel 20, I think I'll just put them right up here on the board for you. Mount Sinai, we've been through that. God wrote the Ten Commandments with His own finger. We've been through that. Here we go. Ezekiel chapter 20 and verse 20. God speaking. And keep the Jews' Sabbaths. Is that what it says? And keep what? 
my Sabbath is holy, that they may be a sign between me and you, that you may know that I am the Lord your God. God says, you keep the Sabbath and everyone will know that I'm the Lord your God. Now think about it. Buddhists can abstain from murder. Buddhists can abstain from adultery. Buddhists can keep nine of the Ten Commandments. But what's the one commandment that would let someone know who you're worshiping? It would be the Sabbath commandment because you say, no, 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 no. I'm going to work six and rest on the seventh because I worship the God of the Bible, the God who created in six days and rested on the seventh. That is the commandment that would let someone know which God it is that I'm serving and worshiping. Does that make sense, everyone? If you say, well, I'm not going to kill, does that make you a Christian? Does that make you a Christian? No, a Muslim could keep that commandment. A Buddhist could keep that commandment. Anyone could keep that commandment. But if you're keeping the seventh day Sabbath because God is the creator and God is the redeemer, immediately everyone knows, oh, that's the God he worships. He worships the God of the Bible, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, the creator God. Amen? Amen. Powerful. So God says, hey, you keep my Sabbath. There'll be a sign between me and you that you may know that I am Jehovah, your God. Verse 12, look at this one. Moreover, I gave them my Sabbaths as a what again? A sign between me and them. Now notice this. This is pure power. That they might know that I am the Lord who sanctifies them. Now the word sanctifies means to set aside for a holy purpose. Does that make sense? So when you're saved, God sanctifies you. He sets you aside for a holy purpose. In the Old Testament, certain articles of furniture were sanctified for the Lord's service. They were set aside for a holy purpose. They were not to be used for profane purposes. They were sanctified. They were set apart for God's own holy purposes. And God says, the Sabbath is a sign that I'm the one who sanctifies you. Can you say amen? Well, let's put modern language on this. What does that mean then? The Sabbath is a sign that it is God alone who can make us holy. He you say amen? Not one person in this room can make that pulpit holy. Not one person in this room can make this sign holy. Not one person in this room can make my shoes holy. Not one person in this room can make themselves holy. The only one that can make you holy is the God who made you in the first place, and that's God in heaven. Amen? The Sabbath is a sign that it is God alone that can make us holy. Watch this. Our own works cannot make us holy. Somebody say amen. amen. Paul said, I know that in me that is in my flesh dwells no good thing. We must trust in and rest in God's work for us. Amen. So watch this. This is, this is the bombshell. Therefore, the Sabbath is a sign of trusting totally in whose righteousness? Christ's righteousness and not our own because the Sabbath is a sign that God's the one that makes us holy. Can you say amen? amen? Powerful. So the Sabbath becomes the most powerful, potent sign of righteousness by faith. In fact, look there at your study guide. The Sabbath is a sign of two powerful things. We've already alluded to them. Number one, it's a sign and symbol of creation. And number two, a sign and symbol of redemption. God is our creator and God is our redeemer. The word redeemer means to purchase. God is the one who purchased us when his son paid the ultimate price for us on the cross with his own blood. Can a Christian say amen to that? So the two reasons that God is worshipped in Revelation is because he's the creator and he's the redeemer. And the Sabbath is a sign. Hey, God's the one that created me in six days and rested on the seventh. And he's my redeemer. God is the one who paid the price for me. Amen? And the Sabbath is a sign of that. That's what he says. The Sabbath is a sign of that. Now look at this. We're back to our study guides. Just as Adam and Eve were called to rest in and enjoy God's work of creation... So too we are called to rest in and enjoy God's work of salvation. I want you just to imagine. Here's Adam. Here's Eve. They've been created. They're in the garden. God says, hey, go check it out. Go explore. I've got hippopotamuses out there and, and dolphins and seals and eagles. Go see. Go, go, go Run along. Run along. Go see how beautiful it is. And they run off and they come back. And say, oh, God, we saw this thing with the longest neck. We've ever seen something. We named it giraffe you know, and just awesome. And they're out there sort of playing in this Edenic garden that God has created for them. And then I can just imagine in my mind's eye, Adam, Adam says, you know, it's not good enough for me to enjoy it. I want to do something myself. And so Adam stoops down and he picks up a piece of clay and he molds it into a little puppy dog, a chihuahua. And uh, he looks, says, God, look what I've created. And he says, yeah, but it's just a piece of dirt. And, and uh, he, he tries to breathe in it as Adam was breathed into it. He, he's blowing on this piece of dirt. Does it ever come to life? And I can just imagine in my mind's eye, Jesus saying, Adam, you're missing the point. 
<laughs> you can't add to this work. You can enjoy this work. So too with salvation. We're saved and we think, oh, I'm going I'm to work my way to heaven. I'm going to add to what God has done. And I know God has said grace, but I've got something I've got to do. And God says, wait, stop trying to work your way to heaven. Enjoy what I have done for you. Amen. Someone say amen. amen. Hallelujah. So it's a sign and symbol of creation. It's a sign and symbol of what? Redemption. Right there at the bottom of that paragraph, what a powerful symbol. God is both creator and redeemer, and the Sabbath is a powerful sign that God is both of these. Who was the creator anyway? Well, that's a good question, isn't it? Who was the creator? Who was the creator? Let me just quote it for you. John chapter 1, beginning in verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Now listen carefully. All things were made by Him, and without Him was nothing made that was made. Amen. So who was the Creator? Jesus. That Jesus was the Creator. God created through Christ Jesus, according to Colossians chapter 1, verse 17. That's in your study guide right there. And this is, this is as old as Christianity itself. Notice this from the Apostolic Creed. You cannot get more Protestant than the Apostolic Creed. O Lord Almighty, Thou hast created the world by... Jesus Christ, and has appointed the Sabbath in memory thereof. God created through Christ Jesus. Can you say amen? Jesus was the creator. Powerful. So you're right there. According to the teaching of the New Testament, Jesus was the one through which God created. Note especially I've given you several verses there. I quoted one of them for you, John chapter 1, and I alluded to Colossians 1, 16 and 17. If Jesus created the air, and Jesus created the water, and the grass, and the birds, and the lions, and the whales, and the octopi, and the hippopotami, then guess what else Jesus created? He created the Sabbath. What, doesn't that make sense? I mean, the same God that made the first day, the second day, the third day, the fourth day, the fifth day, He didn't switch. The same God that made the grass and the giraffes and all of the wonderful things there in Eden is the same God that rested. It was Jesus and His Father and the Spirit working together in cooperation. Can we say amen, someone? Okay, so look at this. If, uh, he gave the Sabbath. Note, not only was Jesus the creator in Eden, He was the lawgiver on Mount Sinai. Now, many Christians do not know this, and it's staggering how few Christians know that the very God who was on Mount Sinai's summit, the very God who wrote with his own finger on tables of stone, that was Jesus Christ. Amen. Remember, Moses was walking there through the desert in Midian, and, and uh, he saw that burning bush, and, and the burning bush spoke and said, go tell that rascal Pharaoh to let my people go. And he said, well, I, I, they're not going to believe me. Who shall I say sent me? And he said, I am that I am has sent you. And Jesus one day was speaking to the religious leaders of his day and, and uh, he said, hey, why don't you guys just accept me? I mean, your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day and he was glad. And they said, what? You got to be kidding. Abraham, you're not even 50 years old. You don't even have any hair on your face. How could you possibly have seen the day of Abraham? And he said, you listen to me, men. You listen very carefully to what I'm going to say. Before Abraham was, I am. Did the Jews understand what he was saying? Yeah, John chapter 8, verse 59 says they picked up stones. They were going to kill him because they knew he was saying, I'm the God of the Old Testament. I'm the one who was on Mount Sinai. I'm the one who appeared to Moses. I'm the lawgiver. Amen and amen. Man, so powerful. I wish I had time to look more at that, but I just don't. So let's continue on here. This is why Jesus Christ repeatedly affirmed that he was Lord of the Sabbath. After all, he's the one that invented it. He created it. He commanded it. Look at Matthew chapter 12, verse 8. For the Son of Man, that's Jesus Christ, is Lord of the Sabbath. Those are the words of Jesus. How about Mark chapter 2, verse 28? Therefore, the Son of Man is also Lord of the Sabbath. Just like he's Lord of the grass, he's Lord of the giraffes, he's Lord of the whales, he's Lord of the Sabbath. He made them all. He's also the Lord of man. Luke chapter 6, verse 5. The Son of Man is also Lord of the Sabbath. Powerful. Jesus says that over and over again. Jesus often healed on the Sabbath. Can you say amen? amen? We already looked at that story in Luke chapter 13 where he healed that woman and the man speaks up and says, whoa, whoa, there are six days on which men ought to labor. Come then and, and be healed on those days. And Jesus says, you're a hypocrite. You're an actor. Every one of you who has a donkey or an ox that falls into the ditch, you lift it out. Ought not this woman being a daughter of Abraham whom Satan has bound be loosed from this, her burden, on the Sabbath? 
Jesus used the Sabbath to show that the Sabbath was a special day created by God for man's uplifting, for his upbuilding, and for his healing and recreation and redemption. In fact, one of the things that Jesus came to do was to disentangle the Sabbath from all of those pathetic and stifling rules that the Pharisees and the scribes had heaped upon it. In fact, that's right in your study guide there. It says, but how did Jesus relate to the Sabbath when he walked as a man on this planet? Look with me at Luke chapter 4, verse 16. You've got your Bibles there, third book of the New Testament. See if you can keep up with me. Luke chapter 4, verse 16. You're doing a great job, by the way. Luke chapter 4, verse 16. Look at this. This is incredible. Luke chapter 4, verse 16. So he came to Nazareth where he had been, what? Brought up. And as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on what day? Sabbath. On the Sabbath day, and he stood up to read. So if it was Sabbath and you wanted to find Jesus, where would you go? You'd go, you'd go to the synagogue. That's right, because that's where he was. That was his custom. He said, oh, hey, I'm looking for Jesus. Have you, have you guys seen Jesus? Oh, yeah, of course. It's Sabbath, my friend. He's in the synagogue. That's his custom. Of course that's where he's going to be. So Jesus actually, as a man, observed and kept the Sabbath. We're continuing on here. It says, note that Jesus performed many of his most powerful miracles on guess what day? The Sabbath. This was to show that the Sabbath is for the benefit of man. He removed it from all of the traditions that the religious leaders, the scribes and the Pharisees had entangled it with. He came to show that it's a blessing, that it's a glorious, wonderful day for the creation and recreation. By the way, I keep saying that word, recreation. Slow it down. Recreation is recreation. Have you ever thought of that before? Recreation is just two words. It's the recreation. It's a day of renewal and, and re, uh, uh, recreation. God is making you into what He originally created you to be. That's why all true creation should draw us closer to God, our Creator. Amen? Amen. Powerful. Last paragraph there. In fact, Jesus in His death even kept the Sabbath. You say, what? He kept the, he kept the Sabbath in His death? You're still in Luke. Look at Luke chapter 23. Someone's out there thinking, oh yeah, I see it. I see it plain as the noonday sun, but how do you know what day the Sabbath is? Listen, I presented this message enough times to know that there's at least half of the people in here thinking, well, how do you know what day the Sabbath is? I mean, how do we know? How could it possibly be? How do we know what day it is? Well, I'll show you how we know. Luke chapter 23, I want to give you a Bible answer. What kind of an answer? That's the answer you want anyway, isn't it? Okay, we're in Luke chapter 23, and here we find the story of the crucifixion. Right? We'll pick it up in verse 53. Then he took it down, speaking of the body of Jesus. Actually, let's pick it up in verse 50. Now, behold, there was a man named Joseph. What was his name? Joseph, Joseph a council member, a good and a just man. He had, con he had not consented to their decision indeed, and he was from Arimathea, a city of the Jews, who himself was also waiting for the kingdom of God. This man went to Pilate. To who, everyone? Pilate, and he asked for the body of Jesus. Then he took it down, he wrapped it in linen, and he laid it in a tomb that was hewn out of rock where no one had ever been laid before. That day was the preparation and the Sabbath drew near. Jesus was crucified on what day? What day of the week? As we say Friday. That's exactly right. Friday. Good Friday. And so the preparation day is Friday. Okay, now notice it goes on here. The Sabbath drew near. Verse 55. And the women who had come with him from Galilee followed after, and they observed the tomb and how his body was laid. You know how the ladies are. They wanted to be sure it was just right. They went in there just to be sure that every... Of course, they were devastated. They were crushed. They were bruised and beaten in their souls. But they wanted to be sure that everything was just right. But watch what happens in the last verse. Then they returned and prepared spices and fragrant oils, and they rested on the Sabbath according to the Amen. commandment. Now, these were the disciples of Jesus. These, these women were the disciples of Jesus. Sometimes you'll hear people say, oh, Jesus did away with the Sabbath. Wait a minute, Jesus did away with the Sabbath. You won't find that anywhere in your Bible. In fact, you find that anywhere in your Bible, I'll give you $10,000 cash. No way, it's not in there. So these were the very disciples of Jesus. They come, they want to be sure the body is just right and they're devastated. They're, oh, but the Sabbath is coming. We'll come back and finish it after the Sabbath. Why? Because they'd been the disciples of Jesus for three and a half years and they had been following His, what word am I going to say? Example. Okay, so Luke chapter 24 and verse 1. Now on the what day of the week? First day of the week, very early in the morning, they and certain other women came with them to the tomb, bringing spices and the ointments which they had prepared. Of course, they've come back to finish the job that they didn't finish yet. Verse 2, but they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. Someone say hallelujah. hallelujah. They went there. The body of Jesus wasn't there. He's risen indeed. Amen. Amen. Powerful. But here's the point. What 
day did Jesus rise from the dead? Sunday. So then the Sabbath would be the day between Good Friday and Sunday. That day is uh, Saturday. So far so good? No questions. Now I want you to think about something here. As we've already learned, they're in creation. Remember I told you to take the word finish and hang it on a hook in your mind? When he had created, when everything was created, first day, second day, third day, fourth day, fifth day, sixth day, and all the work was what? Finished. Then what did he do? He rested. John chapter 19, verse 30. Jesus on the cross, crying out. His last words just before he, just after he says, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. And then he cries out with a strong voice. It is finished. And then he rests on the Sabbath. Just as he rested in creation when the work was finished, he rests in redemption when the work was finished. He rested in the tomb on the Sabbath. Powerful. Absolutely powerful. Are we all there still on our study guides? So you can write that down there just at the bottom of page three. Just as he rested on the day of creation, so he did the same in redemption. Hallelujah and hallelujah. We're on the back page. But what about the apostles? Someone's bound to say, oh, oh, but wait a minute. Wait a minute. The, the disciples changed the day, David. You missed that part. You forgot to read the book of Acts. No, I've read the book of Acts through dozens of times. And I'll tell you again, $10,000 cold, hard cash to anyone who can show me any verse that even hints at the fact that the day was changed by the disciples. And I'm not just whistling Dixie. $10,000 cash is yours if you can come up with it. Jesus himself had said in Mark chapter 2, verse 27, the Sabbath was made for the Jews. Oh, oh, I'm sorry, I misread that. The Sabbath was made for man. And the word man there is anthropos. The study of anthropology is the study of man. The word there is the Sabbath was made for mankind and not man for the Sabbath. In other words, God made man and he had this Sabbath day that he gave. He didn't make this day and say, well, I got this crummy old day. I better go find someone to keep it. No, 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 no. First he made man and then he made that day for him. Amen? Amen. Whew, the Sabbath is made for the benefit of man. Jesus kept the Sabbath even in his death. He kept it in creation. He kept it in redemption. In 108 languages of the world, the word for seventh day of the week is the word Sabbath. My wife is Romanian. And uh, when you say uh, on Saturday, if you want to say happy Sabbath, you say Sabbat Fericit. Sabbat. Sabbat Fericit. If I want to say in Spanish, I say what? Feliz Sabado. Feliz Sabado, okay? And in Russian, it's what? Sabata, right? Where's Vladimir at? Raise your hand. Is he in here? Say it in Russian, Vladimir. Sabota. There you go. Okay. 108 languages. There's no question. In the English language, there's a question because we say Saturday because all of our days, by the way, are named after pagans. The Sunday was the day of the worship of the sun. Thor day was the day of the worship for Thor. Saturday was the day of the worship for Saturn. Monday was the day of the worship for the moon, etc., etc. But in every other language, Sabbath is the day we call Saturday. It's a piece of cake for the Spanish. It's a piece of cake for others. Okay? So let's talk about the apostles. I'm on the back page. Okay? Here we go. And if you're getting questions in your mind, write those questions down because we're going to do our 15 to 20 minute question and answer time right after this. I'll take the questions right live from the floor. Here we go. Not surprisingly, the apostles all kept the what? Sabbath. Sabbath. See, for example, Acts chapter, and there's so many verses here. Go to the book of Acts. I'll show you my personal favorite. Acts chapter 13. Acts what chapter, everyone? 13. 13. I'm in verse 13. That's easy to remember. 13, 13. Acts 13, 13. It says, Now when Paul and his party set sail from Paphos, they came to Perga in Pamphylia, and John, departing from there, returned to Jerusalem. Verse 14, But when they departed from Perga, they came to Antioch and Pisidia, and they went into the synagogue on what day? The Sabbath day, and they sat down. And after the reading of the law and the prophets, the rulers of the synagogue sent to them, saying, Men and brethren, if you have any word of exhortation to the people, say on. Hey, they noticed that Paul had walked in. They said, Whoa, is that... Oh, that's Paul. Hey, Paul, if you have anything you'd like to say to the congregation, the, the pulpit's all yours. Stand up, teach and preach. And so Paul stands up and preaches a powerful sermon on the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Can you say amen? amen? Here's just a few choice verses. Look at verse 30. But God raised him from the dead. Verse 34. And that he raised him from the dead. You see that? Verse 37, I'm in Acts chapter 13, verse 37. But he whom God raised up saw no corruption. Verse 38, therefore let it be known to you, brethren, that through this man is preached what? 
the forgiveness of sin. So look at what he's preaching. He's preaching the resurrection. He's preaching the forgiveness of sins. Verse 39, and by him, Jesus Christ, everyone who believes is justified from all things from which they could not be justified by the law of Moses. So look at what he's preaching. He's preaching the resurrection. He's preaching forgiveness. He's preaching justification. Was Paul a New Testament Christian? Sure he was. He believed in grace, right? Now jump down to verse 42. I mean, that sermon must have been a good one because in verse 42 it says, When the Jews went out of the synagogue, the Gentiles, my virgin sa version says, begged. Look at that. The, the Gentiles begged that these words might be preached to them on the what? Next the next Sabbath. They came up and said, whoa, Paul, we were listening in. We never heard words like that before. Will you please, 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 we want to hear these great truths that you've just preached next Sabbath. This would have been the perfect day for Paul to say, oh, you know what? You don't have to do that because the day has been changed. In fact, the new Christian day of worship is actually tomorrow. So you don't have to wait all the way until next week. I'll see you tomorrow right here on the new Christian day of worship. Oh, that doesn't happen at all. In fact, look what does happen. Uh, verse 43, now when the congregation had broken up, many of the Jews and devout proselytes followed Paul and Barnabas, who speaking to them persuaded them to continue in the grace of God. Verse 44, and on the next Sabbath, almost the whole city came together to hear the word of God. Can you say amen? I've given you many other verses there that you can go look up on your own, but it is plain as the noonday sun that every one of Jesus' disciples kept the Sabbath. That's exactly right. Now, why wouldn't they? After all, every single true follower of God, I'm on the study guide now, every single true follower of God from Adam to Abraham and from Abraham to Moses and from Moses to Jesus and from Jesus to the apostles kept that special day as a memorial of creation and redemption. You cannot name one follower of God in the Bible that didn't keep the Sabbath. There's not one of them. There's not one of them. Every single person in the Bible that was a follower of the true God was a Sabbath keeper. Isn't that powerful? So, hey, how many of you today want to be followers of the true God? Well, then you're in good company if you choose to keep the Sabbath as well. Now, look at this. Wow, I didn't know that. Study guide. The Sabbath is all about Jesus Christ and our relationship with Him. Can someone say amen? That's what it's all about. It's all about our relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Yet despite the overwhelming evidence, many Christians still believe that the Bible teaches Sunday observance. They base this on three main texts, okay? Now, many people are wondering if the Bible teaches Sunday sacredness and Sunday observance, okay? Despite the overwhelming evidence that we've presented here. And by the way, I'm not just whistling Dixie. I'm not kidding about this $10,000 thing. I make that as a solemn promise to you before the Lord. You find me any text that indicates even at all that the Sabbath has been changed, it first come, first serve. $10,000 is yours. I'm not just whistling Dixie. Despite the overwhelming evidence, some people say, no, 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 no. Surely it's in there somewhere. And there are three verses that are used to prove Sunday observance. These are the three verses, okay? So some of you are thinking, I never heard this before. I'm going to go back and ask my pastor. Nothing wrong with asking your pastor, especially if he's a good man, a godly man that you trust. But let me just give you one word of advice. We should go to the Bible and be checking our pastors out with the Bible, not the Bible out with our pastors. Someone say amen. Okay? Hey, listen. Nobody believes in going to spiritual leaders and spiritual mentors more than me. But I want to tell you something. If you came up to me and you showed me a plain thus saith the Lord, and I was like, well, you know, I'm not going to follow it, then you should say, hey, listen, I'm going somewhere else. Okay? Nothing wrong with having a godly spiritual mentor. We need more godly spiritual mentors. But just, just because many of you I know are thinking, well, I can't wait to ask my pastor about this. Listen, ask your pastor about it. But let me just be honest with you about something. We need to be in the habit of checking our pastors out by the word and not the word out by our pastors. Amen? And I, that applies to me, by the way. In fact, that applies to me first and foremost because I'm speaking to you so frankly and so boldly. These are the three verses that you're going to find. Go with me very quickly to John chapter 20. These are the verses you're going to find. People are going to say, oh, no, I'll show you. They kept, this, they kept Sunday in the New Testament. Well, let's see. John chapter 20. Jesus has been crucified, and the disciples are deadly afraid. They, they've heard that the body is turned up missing. And they're deadly afraid that they're going to be charged. So in verse 19, John chapter 20, verse 19. I want everyone there. John chapter 20, what verse? 19. Then the same day at evening being the first day of the week. What day of the week? Sunday. First day of the week, which is? Sunday. Sunday. You've got it. So Sunday. They said, there it is. There it is right there. See, Sunday worship. 
Well, keep watching. When the doors were shut, the disciples were assembled. There it is. There's a worship service. See? Except the problem is, is there's a comma, not a period. The comma, and then it says, they were assembled for fear of the what? Jews. Jesus came and stood in the midst of them and said to them, peace be with you. Beloved, they didn't even yet believe in the resurrection when they're in that room. They're afraid that they're going to be charged with the missing body of Jesus, and they're in that room just afraid for fear of the Jews. There's no worship service going on there. They're hiding. They're deadly afraid. Are we all clear? So you, you, there's no Sunday worship there. Acts chapter 20, you can go to that one. No worship service there. 1 Corinthians chapter 16 is the only time the only time the Apostle Paul in all of his voluminous writings, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, Thessalonians, Romans, Corinthians, all of Paul's voluminous writings, that's the only place he ever mentions the first day of the week. And all he says about it is, hey, listen, when I come through town, I'm on my way to Jerusalem. There's a famine in Jerusalem, and I want to take up an offering for those who are going through difficult times. Get all your offerings together so I can pick it up on the first day of the week when I'm on my way through. That's it. That's it. Those are the texts. Those are the texts. And I'm telling you right now, in the, in the fear of God and in the sight of God, there's not one scintilla of a hint, of an idea, of a suggestion of anything like Sunday keeping in one of those verses. Nothing. Nothing, 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 nothing. So let's continue then. You notice there on your screen it says, yet these texts when read in context. What word did I say, everyone? Context. Always read your Bible in context. Amen? Because there's a danger. Ooh, there's a danger that you're going to be in such a hurry. You're going to say, oh, Lord, I'm in a hurry today. I just need you to speak to me. I need you to speak to me out of your word. And here we go. And it says, and Judas hung himself. You think, well, that's not really what I was looking for. Let's try that again. Lord, I need a word from you today. Go thou and do likewise. Whoa, that's not what I was looking for. So we say, all right, Lord, come on now. I need another word. I need... What thou doest, do quickly. Now, be beloved, that's not an appropriate way to study your Bible. Amen? Amen. I mean, that, yeah, that you can study your Bible that way, but you can make the Bible say any old thing you want it to say. But if you want to study your Bible responsibly, what word, everyone? Responsibly, you study it in context. Okay? So you go look at every one of those verses, and every, listen, that could be $30,000 for you right there. You go look at those verses in context, you get every one of those, that's, that's $30,000, $10,000 per verse. Okay? Jesus Christ is pointing us to His Holy Sabbath. So we ask the question here then, so, so then who did it? Well, well, what happened? I mean, I never heard this before. My, whoa, 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 slow down, Pastor David. You're going to, what happened? The answer, as we saw at the beginning, is this. Who changed it? God didn't do it. I am the Lord, I change not. In fact, he carved those Ten Commandments out of stone, blue sapphire stone taken from his own throne. So we know God didn't do it. I am the Lord, I change not. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. Jesus didn't do it. Think not that I am come to destroy the law of the prophets. I came not to destroy, but to Fulfill the very last saying to you until heaven and earth pass away, not one jot or one tittle shall no wise pass from the law. One Jesus. The disciples didn't do it. The disciples were keeping the Sabbath all the way through. In fact, the Bible says in Revelation chapter 1, verse 10, John says, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. Somebody says, oh, there it is, the Lord's day. No, there's only one Lord's day in the whole Bible. The Lord's day is the day that Jesus is the Lord of. And we've already read that. Therefore, the Son of Man is Lord of the... Sabbath day. So the Lord's day is his day. It's the only day that's the Lord's day in all the Bible. So you got John keeping the Sabbath. You have Jesus in Matthew chapter 24 and verse 20 say, pray that your flight be neither in the winter nor on the Sabbath day. Now Jesus knew that his crucifixion was just in a few short days. And when he said that, he knew that the destruction of Jerusalem would come in 70 AD. Now Jesus was crucified in 31 AD. The destruction of Jerusalem was in 70 AD. That's 39 years later. And Jesus says, hey, 39 years later from now, when you're keeping the Sabbath, pray that you don't have to flee on that day. Jesus knew his disciples would be keeping the Sabbath. Is that clear? It's powerful. Disciples, well, then who did it? There's our answer. He shall speak great words against the Most High and shall persecute the saints of the Most High and shall enchant, intend to change times and... Whose times? God's times. Whose laws? God's laws. You've got it. That's exactly right. The Bible, we, sh we should have expected that. That's exactly what we were told. Jesus says, all power is given unto me in heaven and on earth. All power. 
Rome versus Christ. That was the decision that the people had to make outside of Pontius Judgment Hall. They said, give us Barabbas. I mean, their choice was, who do you want? Do you want Rome or do you want Jesus? They said, we have no king but Caesar. Same choice comes down to us today. Is it Rome or Jesus? It's Rome or Jesus. Hey, listen, I, I, like I told you, I'm just providing you with the facts. What you do with the facts is between you and your Lord. Amen? Amen. But you need to have the facts. Hey, listen, a doctor just gives you the facts. You make your own decisions. According to the book of Revelation, there will be how many calls to worship? Two calls to worship. How many claims on authority? Two calls. All right, there's a slide here I want to get to. And this is it right here. Jesus Christ. And this is right on your study guide. Concerning the Sabbath. Here it is. Jesus Christ, in the beginning, He created the Sabbath. Jesus Christ, at Mount Sinai, He commanded the Sabbath. Jesus Christ in His life worshipped on the Sabbath. Jesus Christ in His death observed the Sabbath. Jesus Christ in His church continues the Sabbath. And Jesus Christ in Revelation says His last day people will keep the Sabbath. Somebody says to me, hey, why do you keep the Sabbath? You trying to be a legalist? Are you kidding me? I'm no legalist. I love the Lord Jesus Christ with all my heart and I want to do whatever He asks me to do, not in order to be saved, but because He's already saved me by His grace. Amen? Somebody says, hey, why do you keep the Sabbath? I say, hey, if, if it's good enough for Jesus, it's good enough for me. That's why I keep the Sabbath, because I love the Lord. Jesus said in John chapter 14, verse 15, if you love me, keep my commandments. Now, beloved, tonight you've been given information. You've been given what? Information. I want you to know that I believe with every ounce of my heart that the information that's been given to you tonight is true and biblical, but I'm just a man, and men can be wrong. Amen? So that's why I challenge you to go home, to study it out for yourself, to see if what I've said is true. And if it is true, by the grace of God, say with Joshua, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Amen? Two questions. Number one, was tonight's presentation clear? And number two, will you go and check it out for yourself? Let's pray. Father in heaven, Tonight, we present ourselves to you, Father. If this is true, we want to live it. We want to know it. We want to love it. So, Father, give us a sense from your word, not from some feeling, not from some church, not from some tradition, from your word, what's true. And we thank you for your goodness to us, God. You are good. We are nothing. You are good. We are dust. You are good. You are our creator and redeemer, and we turn our lives over to you. You made us, you manufactured us, you love us, you redeemed us. We're yours. Everything we have is yours. Our money is yours, our checkbook is yours, our cars are yours, our children are yours, our everything is yours. God, teach us how to render to you what is already yours and soften and transform our hearts to your glory. In Jesus.